Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today on our discussion on uh, anti-Semitism, which uh, is a timely and uh, important discussion. Uh, my name is Avery Marshall and I'm the program director for the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice. Uh, OCCJ is a human relations organization dedicated to achieving respect and understanding for all people through education, advocacy, and dialogue. And we've been in Tulsa since 1934. And um, our programs reach a, a broad range of ages from second graders to working adults. And uh, our moderator today will be Moises Echeverria, who is the president and CEO of OCCJ. Um, he's been involved with OCCJ for 15 years, first as a participant and then as a volunteer and now as a staff member. And he has facilitated multiple trainings, retreats, and focus groups and other programs with the goal of helping individuals and organizations achieve success through inclusion. So thank you again for joining us. And I'll go ahead and pass that over to Moises. Thank you, Avery. Uh, yeah, I'm very humbled to be part of, to have this conversation. And I would like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have Roberta Clark with us, who is the Executive Director of the Jewish Federation of Greater Oklahoma City since 2016. Prior to moving to Oklahoma City, Ms. Clark spent 14 years working for the Anti-Defamation League. Throughout her career, she has developed and implemented interfaith security con conferences, trained thousands of law enforcement professionals on issues related to hate groups, extremism, and terrorism, worked with dozens of educational institutions to provide trainings in the areas of bullying, and provided guidance and assistance to community members who believe they have been the victims of discrimination or hate crimes. She graduated from the University of Houston with a bachelor's in arts in political science and holds dual master uh, degrees in Jewish education and Jewish studies from Gratz College in uh, Melrose Park. Uh, Drew Diamond uh, is also joining us. He's the executive director of the Jewish Federation of Tulsa. He joined the Federation staff in 2010, following two years as an administrator with Union Public Schools and 16 years as director of training for the Police Executive Research Forum. He served as Tulsa's chief of police, retiring in 1991 after 22 years of service. Prior to joining the Tulsa Police Department, he was an employee of the Federal Bureau of Investigation until he entered the US Army and became an agent in the Army Criminal Investigations Command. He is a graduate of Northeastern Oklahoma University the FBI National Academy and the FBI National Executive Institute. And lastly, we have with us Rabbi Dan Kamen, who is originally from Florida and spent his formative years in New Jersey. He earned a master's degree and, and rabbinic ordination from the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles, California. Rabbi Kamen is a strong believer in social activism motivated by Jewish learning and strives to teach a Judaism of passionate engagement, self-critical reflection and experimental creativity. So thank you all for your time and for being part of this very important conversation. So we are here to talk about anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism is not a word that most individuals use in their day-to-day -day lives. So, uh, for our viewers, I wanted to, to share um, my favorite definition of it and because it's so simple and this comes from the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, they state that anti-Semitism is the belief or behavior hostile towards Jews simply because they are Jewish. Uh, and this can take several forms uh, such as religious teachings that proclaim that Jews are somehow inferior to others, uh, or as political efforts to isolate, oppress, or otherwise injure people who are Jewish. Uh, it is also at the individual level, can be a prejudice or stereotypes that individuals hold um, against Jews. Uh, and, and the reason why this has been so problematic um, is because of a recent report that the Anti-Defamation um, League published stating that last year, uh, 
in 2019 in the United States, we saw the most anti-Semitic incidents since at least 1979. So last year, there were over 2,100 incidents recorded. Uh, that was a 12% increase from 2018 and more than double of incidents uh, from just four years earlier in 2015. Uh, it's the highest number that has ever been recorded by the ADL since it began uh, tallying these incidents in 1979. And, uh, we, and, and we have seen over the last decade a steady climb um, of uh, anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, last year, there was uh, a number of high profile um, incidents. Um, in April of 2019, um, a gunman killed one person and wounded three others in a synagogue shooting in Poway, California. And then in December, there were two shooters who killed four individuals uh, at a kosher supermarket in Jersey City. And then uh, 18 days later, there was an attacker who killed one person and wounded four in a stabbing at a Hanukkah party in New York. So uh, with all of that information, I wanna ask the first question to the panel, which is as Jewish professionals, what are your concerns regarding anti-Semitism? So thank you so much for the for pulling us all together and uh, for that great setup for what is such an important discussion. Um, my response in talking about um, our concerns is really the physical security of Jewish organizations and uh, members of the Jewish community. These incidents require all of us to focus on how we plan worship services, study opportunities, social opportunities, events, programs, um, how we market them, how we handle registration. We have to add new layers of security to ensure we know who's coming to our program. So I will tell you that our federation does not hold an event where we don't require pre-registration. And we call those names every time leading up for, for weeks leading up to the event. If there's someone we don't know, we look into them to make sure that they're not someone we need to be concerned about. Um, we as Jewish organizations have to hire, not unlike unfortunately many other uh, community groups and religious groups have to hire security for events um, because you want, you, we don't want people to be scared and we don't want people to not show up, but we need to be prepared. And so we need security policies and procedures in place for our organizations and our facilities, but also our programs and our events. And part of that includes a great cost to all of our budgets because you can't be wrong. Um, we have to be bright every time um, uh, because we never know when the bad guys might wanna do something harmful. And so there are costs involved and unfortunately very often there's fear involved by many people, but I'll just, I'll add the, one of the components that makes it really challenging and that is regardless of people's opinions about the Middle East or politics in Israel or politics in the US or anywhere else, when there is a rise of issues of concerns in Israel and Gaza and the West Bank, um, or as you had commented, uh, an anti-Semitic issue or incident that occurs, there is a threat level that goes up for all of our organizations where, where we have to worry about harassing phone calls, threatening phone calls, vandalism, uh, sometimes physical attacks. And so you have to be on guard all of the time, you have to worry, gee, we need to ask for extra patrols around our cemetery so that tombstones aren't, you know, desecrated, um, because that's something that happens when there's a rise in anti-Semitic incidents. Thank you. Uh, uh, Roberta, I might add, Roberta's got all those things, as she always does, correct. Uh, you know, the... From my perspective, building on, uh, on, on those observations, I've, I've dealt with uh, anti-Semitism, you know, uh, as a Jewish child, uh, and certainly until today. Um, and, and, you know, in my, in my adult years, particularly the first 25 or so years, 
from a policing standpoint. And I, dealing with the Ku Klux Klan, the White Ann Resistance, the various neo-Nazi groups and hate groups, over, all, over those years and certainly the last decades, we've seen an evolution in those groups. And looking back on it, uh, from, a, from a protection standpoint and enforcement standpoint, uh, uh, as we worked as communities to get enhanced hate crime uh, uh, legislation and, and the work we, we all have done there, uh, it was easy enough to identify the overt uh, uh, anti-Semite you know, they're right out there marching with the, with the same people who are, who, who, who are oppressing all, all racial and minority groups. Um, and what happened is, is the two things that, that have to be recognized. One is the advent of the internet, the advent of social media, the advent is, is added, added an enhancement that, uh, that has become more than difficult to, to deal with and manage and control. And it's become a, a way to incite and recruit others into, into this hate-filled atmosphere and promulgate uh, you know, hate lies and propaganda uh, at a level you know, the human race has not seen before. Um, you know, as, as an observation, for example, what most people know about anti-Semitism, they think about Nazis and the Holocaust and stuff. You know, the Nazis did not invent anti-Semitism. Uh, what they did was enhance it. They built on it. They built on, uh, on centuries of, uh, of hate that existed. I mean, just an example, you can go back to 12th century France and Jews were made to wear yellow circles on their clothes to identify them as Jews. So that this sense of coming into uh, us today uh, sadly has a long history uh, but the challenge of dealing with, uh, with, with this uh, social media sense of recruitment, and then you put it into a, and I'll be quite candid about it, you put it into a political atmosphere that is designed to divide and create hate, and you, you, the, the ratcheting up of, of anti-Semitism uh, sadly is not surprising. Uh, dealing with it is, is what the challenge is. And I think here with OCCJ and our federations and, and, and our, our Jewish institutes and, and, and our community institutes, I mean, we'll talk here in a little bit. Uh, part of the way we deal with that is doing what we're doing now is about community strength building. And, uh, and so this is an important conversation on many levels. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew and Roberta. And thank you, Moises and Avery and all of OCCJ for convening our, our time together. Um, this might be surprising to hear from a rabbi to say, but I love Judaism. Okay, it's not that surprising. It's the most obvious thing. I love being Jewish and what it means to be Jewish and what it means to experience the world through the lens that I was born into, the family values, the ways of celebrating and eating and singing and dancing and, and, and connecting. And, 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 and I love everything about what, or almost everything, I don't, not blind love, I'm critical and reflective, but I, I, I do love everything that my community has given me and that I'm able to give to my community. And I love, uh, I love the opportunities when uh, to, to share my Judaism um, with others, um, either so they can experience it and see it the way that I experience it, or so that they can simply have that as a, as a helpful reference point in their own lives and in their own journeys. I, I, I think that that is essential. And so as someone who's made my life about my love of Judaism and sharing my love of Judaism with others, the topic of anti-Semitism is, is really challenging. It's challenging because it's a reality that, um, um, it's a reality that so many others uh, uh, perceive as what Jews are or the way in which Jews have to show themselves to the world. And it also is a challenge because all of those security issues, which uh, Roberta, 
and Drew spoke about really importantly, create barriers for folks to experience what Jewish life is. And so when I think about the current moment of anti-Semitism, one of the things from the inside out, I'm thinking about how we can be mindful of all these security issues and remain the open, hospitable, and welcoming and engaging community that we've been for, uh, for as long as I've known it and for what I believe is at the core of who we are. If, if we can't be open and welcoming, then I'm not so sure we have much to protect at the same time. So that's where I find myself caught. Um, as as we have encountered the past year, and um, and uh, as we head into the things, the, 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 this new reality that we're now living in in uh, in in the Zoom world. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for for your answers, Rabbi. I want to follow up with you, and and thank you for for your answer. Uh, as as the religious leader of one of the Jewish communities in Oklahoma, why? From your perspective, why do some people have fear and even hated Jewish indi Jewish individuals in the religion as a whole? Moises, I wish I had an answer to that question. I think that's that's one of the great mysteries of 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 this topic. If we knew why folks were angry. Uh, accusatory, uh, acting in all the ways they, they are and do sometimes act towards Jews, then we might be able to address it. But the, one of the great mysteries is it's, it's hard to understand exactly why. What I do know is that, and this comes from my experience as, as being someone who is Jewish and who lives in a world where I am a minority and where I am someone who is different. And oftentimes I think people perceive differences or can perceive differences as an insult or as a takedown of someone else's stance. If I don't believe the way you believe, then I must think that you are wrong and I am right. And therefore there is only one truth there is only one way of being, and therefore those people might want to take down the way I believe such that they can reinforce the way they believe. Uh, there's, a, there's a book um, by a, a rabbi, a teacher of mine, Rabbi Brad Hirschfeld, called You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right. Um, and he's speaking really from the inside of the Jewish experience. And as Jews, we know this reality because it's one Jew, 17 opinions, two Jews, 400 opinions, that world that we know exists. Um, and, and we are not operating in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a world of ultimate truths that uh, are superior than others. But, but I think for, for folks who, who maybe are looking at the Jewish community from the outside in, they might see the differences. They might see the, my, this minority experience and see that in some way as, as threatening to the values they hold so close and, and so dear to them, to themselves. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for that answer. I, I love the, the title of that book, uh, you don't have to be wrong for me to be right. Um, and so thank you for, for, for that. Uh, Drew, I want to I have a question for you. Uh, in Tulsa, we have had our fair share of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, as the executive director of the Jewish Federation of Tulsa, what has been your experience uh, combating anti-Semitism here locally? I think... I think we've had we've had some incidents over the years. Uh, uh, yeah, relative to what's happened to the violence and the murders and things that happened uh, to Jewish communities around the country, uh, we uh, we have uh, happily have not had that happen here. What what we deal with here though is, and and it goes back even to the days uh, back in the eighties when I was. Uh, on the police department in the 90s as police chief, uh, we'd, we'd have incidents then. And we learned as a community uh, to create a community response, not just, just, not just the Jewish community. When there's an incident uh, where when Muslims in our community are attacked, we are part of responding to, to protecting and, and responding to that, or African-Americans or Native Americans, or, you know, 
uh, or, or our Asian community and stuff. It really doesn't matter which minority is attacked, but we've managed to build what matters is we've built a framework around each other to protect each other. That sends, that sends strength. And by the way, to be clear, uh, in the majority community in, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the majority community is white and, and religiously Christian. They are also part of this protective uh, blanket that we put together. Uh, because, so it's not just, it's not an us against them kind of thing that we create when you create community, because I know that's what o OCCJ stands for. When you create community, you create community for everybody. And what the bad actors see, what, you know, what they see when they, when, when they rise up is they say, you know, and I've interviewed them, I've arrested them. I know how, what they say and what they say is, oh, we didn't expect that. You know, we thought everybody would rally with us and, you know, go burn a cross, you know, go, uh, the, when I was police chief, the Klan threatened to burn a cross on my lawn, uh, you know, and, and that didn't happen. Uh, you know, because this community has a response that, that's built in. So that's, a, but that takes community building for strength, takes work every single day. You have to do this work as we're doing today before the events happen. You have to do it between the incidences. You can't wait each time for something to happen to get organized. People knowing the history of Tulsa. Uh, you know, going back to, to, to the race massacres, know that we have worked hard to build that mechanism into our community. It's, by the way, it's a work in progress. It's not completed by any means. Thank you, Drew. Um, Roberta, uh, I want to ask you uh, uh, a question in regards to the most recent incident that occurred in Oklahoma City at the the hacking of, of uh, graduation just uh, two weekends ago, where a swastika and some racist words were written on the screen. Um, what, do you, what do you make of that? First of all, I have to say, Drew, create community for everyone is a fabulous line that I'm officially stealing. Um, I will tell you in Oklahoma City, sadly, we have the, the common experience of the bombing uh, 25 years ago that I believe did for this community uh, in a positive way brought the, uh, for horrible reasons, brought the interfaith community together in similar ways that you were saying, but that line is we have to create community for everyone is really spectacular. Um, the OCU graduation, look, uh, to, to th this date, I don't know if they know who the perpetrator or perpetrators was, were. I don't know if it was someone thinking they were be, being funny and cute and wanted attention or if it, because that does happen with hateful messaging, particularly uh, very often when kids are out of school, um, that happens. Those kinds of incidents, vandalism, um, hateful things online when people have more time on their hand, not just kids to be fair. Um, so I don't know the intention it may have thought someone, it may have been someone thinking they were being cute, but I sure know the impact. People were horrified and um, upset and worried that that kind of messaging um, could be, you know, hacked into what was supposed to be a very special, meaningful graduation ceremony that I'm sure was still very special in spite of the hacking. And it made me think about really sort of, um, three things. One is we don't get heart and mind control of other people. And whether someone's doing something, that second part of intention versus impact, whether someone's doing something not understanding the impact, um, or they very clearly understand the impact, we don't get heart and mind control. Um, what we get is the control on how we're going to respond, how we're going to convene the community to be part of the response, as Drew so eloquently said. And we get to choose whether or not we're going to be silent which never I would suggest makes a situation better or makes it go away, or we're going to stand up and speak out in appropriate ways. Um, I would suggest that responding to hatred with hatred or responding to name calling with name calling doesn't really push the game forward. And I think very often we respond with uh, what we say in Yiddish, our kishkas, our guts, that there's that sort of knee jerk reaction. Well, you're gonna call me a jerk. I'm gonna tell you you're a jerk, right? 
that doesn't impact positive change. We impact positive change when we respond in a timely fashion with good words, with more words and with good words. Um, and, and that is in fact what we saw President Martha Berger do of the university immediately speak out saying, we do not agree with these horrific statements of, and, and symbols of racism and anti-Semitism. That is not what our university stands for. We're turning everything over to uh, law enforcement to have them look into it. And we're making available counseling or other opportunities. The last, to, to support those who, who feel hurt by it. The last thing um, that I'll say to that is that when those things happen, she responded well, many others responded well. And so within the interfaith community and outside of the interfaith community, many people stood up and spoke out and said, that doesn't represent us. That's not the Oklahoma standard. And so what we can all do, even though it's challenging at times, is find our voice and use it in an appropriate way with the goal of impacting positive change. Thank you so much, Roberta, for, for your, your thoughts on that. It made me, it reminded me uh, your comment about um, uh, we get to decide our actions when we see an incident like this and using our, our actions to be uplifting. Uh, reminded me of a quote from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, when he said that darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that, which is, is a quote that, you know, is engraved in, in my mind. And, and I really take it to heart when I see these atrocious incidents and that I need to be um, I need to use my, my actions to uplift and not to respond with that same hate, uh, but to really help people in the community, like Drew said, to, to build that community. So thank you uh, to the three of you. Uh, I wanna ask a question for, for the three of you, uh, whoever would like to share. Um, can you please share some of the hopeful moments, uh, the, the pleasant moments of building community and community responding uh, when the Jewish community has experienced anti-Semitism. I'll just make one comment. When we had the horrific shooting at the Pittsburgh synagogues, um, we, uh, the next night, um, and, and through great leadership of Temple B'nai Israel um, and our law enforcement, we held a community vigil. And 500 people, 500 diverse people of all works of life, of many different faith traditions and of no faith traditions showed up. Sadly, soon after that, when there was a horrific attack on the mosque in New Zealand, um, many of us, hundreds of us showed up at uh, the mosque here in Oklahoma City. Um, and so I think that is, those for, for very sad reasons, those are still the hopeful moments that people understand showing up does matter. I, I wanna, echo R Roberta's comments and the thing that I was thinking about similarly was a couple of days after that Pittsburgh shooting when we had more folks in uh, Congregation B'nai Muna's building than ever before. Um, people from all over the city, religious leaders, faith leaders, political leaders um, who came to offer in messages of solidarity, of, of hope, of, of, of community. Um, and, and, and that knowing that that happens and that that can happen is, is, is gives me immense strength. I, but I think the other piece of this that gives me hope actually has something to do with the forum that's bringing us together right now. If you think about it, let's see, OCCJ was founded as a chapter of NCCJ lose some history. NCCJ means national council, national conference or council. Oh. Conference, conference of Christian mm -hmm. Conference of Christians and Jews. What year was that, Moises? Do you have a, a sense? 1927 of in New York City was when the it was when the original chapter established in Oklahoma in Tulsa, 1958. 1927, 1958. So, our generations before us took on the explicit task of creating dialogue between Christians and Jews, and 
the organization we are now a part of is OCCJ, and we've renamed it to be the Oklahoma Conference for Community and Justice, partly because that mission that took one one relationship and made it was about having one strong relationship became about bringing many people together. Um, and, 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 and I love that, um, in fact, the OCCJ has changed its name and uh, reworked its vision a little bit to respond to, let's say, um, maybe beginning to achieve some of its original goals and being ready to take on other goals. I, I think th the fact that OCCJ exists is, uh, is, a, is a hopeful prayer, a hopeful wish, and a hopeful sign of our society's ability to, uh, to build these relationships and to uh, respond to and address anti-Semitism in all the ways that it, that, it, that it shows itself, but also not just anti-Semitism, all forms of hatred, bigotry, oppression that are, um, that, are, that, are, that are realities for so many people in the world that we live in. And I can, I can echo that. Uh, I think the rabbi said it so well. But I, I tell you, I, I would add that that part of what I what I, I take a, a lot of solace in is what doesn't happen uh, over the years, and even contemporarily, because of my position now and, and years ago, uh, I. I'm aware of, of information about these, particularly these uh, these active uh, anti-Semitic and racist uh, groups, uh, and what what they're unable to do. You know, we said, okay, they can do lots in the internet, they can do lots of the stuff, but they're they're unable to certainly here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to get a foothold strong enough uh, to be visible. You know. You know, they're, you know, and, and that says a lot about, about the community. There are other communities, sadly, around our country where, where, where these groups are, are in the streets, they're more visible, they have, you know, they have marches, they have organization. Uh, we're, we're working hard not to let that happen. So I, I think that's, that's one indication. The other thing that I'm, I, I, I'm joyful about is whether it be uh, our we, with our Hispanic community or our Black community or our Muslim community, it is that that beyond just being a community together, it's about it's about actual organization. We actually you know uh, work together as as activist community. You know, being <laughs> Ruben Bernard said it. You know, because we're not name callers and we're not stuff doesn't mean we're passive, you know, at all. Uh, we, we, we are, when it, when it comes to dealing with anti-Semitism and, and hate and all those things, we are in fact aggressive. And, 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 we're, uh, and so if you're going to threaten us as, as a community, uh, there's gonna be a response and, and that is, um, you know, that's you know whether it's a political response uh, you know, or a or a community response, and there there will be a response. And so yeah, the messaging is clear, uh, at least from my standpoint. Uh, that uh, listen, we you know I don't believe that 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 people should tolerate other people. You know to, if you tolerate me as a Jew, what you're saying is you know okay, I give you permission. To be here, you know. At times in our history, we've had that permission revoked, and so I don't want to be tolerated. You know, I don't want our community to be tolerated. We are part of this community. We are part of the fabric, and so respect is what you do for each other and respecting each other. Uh, so we're uh, we're going to build on those kind of premises uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. I wanted to ask um, as well um, uh, a question involving youth. So at OCCJ, we do a lot of work in the schools. And, um, uh, and so I have some ideas. But I, from your, your experience, what has been or, or how do you talk to young people about anti-Semitism? whether it is your experience within 
uh, youth who are Jewish and or just youth in general? I, I think it has to start with the premise of how we treat people and treat people who are not like us. And I think that, you know, when we look at anti-Semitism, the source of anti-Semitism is hatred. Um, it, uh, hatred is manifested in many ways and there are particular uh, communities with particular immutable characteristics that are constantly targeted. We've mentioned many of them, but not all of them today. And so I think we start with hatred and the impact of hatred. Um, and, I, and then I think anti-Semitism, going back to the very beginning, Moises, of your definition that you shared from ADL on anti-Semitism, um, what that is, and we unpack it. And, you know, how can you um, choose to hate someone when you don't know them as a human being? You don't know what their knowledge or skills or personality is or isn't. And so it's no different regardless of the immutable characteristics. So I think we do need to focus on anti-Semitism, um, Islamophobia, anti-LGBT stuff, um, uh, certainly racist, uh, anti-Black, anti-Latino. I mean, there, we've got far too many examples every single day in this country and in our cities. Um, but I think we have to start with understanding that we have to teach about the impact of hatred and that jokes and things which are just kidding sometimes have a negative impact. And I'll just, I'll end with this comment. Certainly in my ADL days, many family and friends would say, oh, Roberta, you're so PC, we can't joke about anything around you. You know, you get upset about everything we say. And, and my response is a little, I, I hope nuanced. My response is, if you know that a particular word or phrase hurts someone's feelings, even if you think it's ridiculous, especially if you think it's ridiculous and you don't agree, if you know that it is, the impact is hurtful, why would you say it? It's that simple. You don't have to agree, going back to what Rabbi said, right, with the book, you don't have to agree, but if you know that there's an impact that's negative towards another human being, even if you don't like the other human being, why would you take that action? And I think that's what we have to teach. Thank you. Um, as Jews, our central document or one of our central documents is the Torah, what do Christians call the Old Testament. And in Torah, there's one command that appears more often than any other command. Some say 35, some say 36. Depends on how you count that command. But the command is, do not oppress the stranger. Why? Because you know the experience of what it means to be the stranger. And I think that's an important lesson for adults as well as it is for kids. We all know what it's like to be the outsider, to not have the lunch table to sit at in middle school, or to feel like we were not part of whatever it is, or to feel somehow different. And if we can tap into that experience of feeling different, then we, we can also remember that we don't want to create that experience for others. Because as good as it is sometimes to be different, to be pushed aside, to feel outsider, to feel outcast, is destructive and harmful and alienating, literally alienating. Um, and so I, I, I think to the extent that we can speak to each other in reference to the experiences we've had, the experiences that people know about what it means to be outsider, because I, I think everyone has, I think that's a, that's a, that's a universal human experience. Um, and to use that as a wellspring and as a source for exploration and growth and response to our own actions and to what we do for others and, and also understanding of others. Um, I, I, I think even little kids understand um, or can begin to understand how their actions might affect others and how others' actions affect them. Um, and the more we can make those messages, um, things everyone hears all the time, uh, I think the easier it is for us to um, 
to live in the political, politically correct world that uh, Roberta elegantly describes and importantly describes. Yeah, I, I would only add that, you know, we, we also have available for us uh, here, the Sherwin Miller Museum of Jewish Art, which is a platform, I mean, for the thousands of students that, that, that we bring to our museum, that come to our museum uh, and our, our Holocaust educators, our Holocaust education is, is part of that platform that allows us with, with, with children uh, to, to engage them in a conversation that is very difficult, uh, you know, and, uh, and so that helps. Uh, and and through, uh, through other cultural education work with children, uh, we have essay contests, uh, the White Rose contest and Purim mass contest, and those things. That, that those are not just for Jewish children. Those are for all children. And and again, for our community, the the, the exciting thing about that is, is for example, in, in the Any Given Child program uh, for Tulsa, uh, our museum ha brings every eighth grader in Tulsa public schools every year through uh, through this experience. Um, so. Children and, and what we've learned from that is is that uh, I mean is what we've always known is that you're not born hateful. Uh, you, it, hating is is a learned behavior, uh, and uh, and so is loving, and so you uh, you counter it uh, by teaching the counter, and that's. Uh, but also by educating, by building in particular for young people and particularly in their students, students, it gives them strength if they actually have some facts, something to understand that they, they can counter uh, the nonsense with. Thank you all. There were there's so many wonderful nuggets of wisdom in all of your answers and um, and, and I will recap them at the end, but uh, all of you have uh, shared some suggestions of what individuals can do. But I wanna ask very directly, um, if you have any thoughts, any additional thoughts, what would you say to someone who has a friend or maybe a fam family member who shares anti-Semitic remarks or jokes um, and doesn't know how to respond to them? I think asking, assuming goodwill is always important. Again, I think sometimes we all, we all have bias and we all have learned sayings that we didn't know were insulting and we use them. And, and so I think we assume goodwill and we encourage the person to approach privately the person who raised concern, who said things that were inappropriate and say, what did you mean by that? Or, you know, I don't know if you know this, but that the, the end of your joke really lands as anti-Semitic or as racist or as whatever. I think if we assume goodwill, we sometimes have the opportunity to teach. It can be a teachable moment. If we respond again with that sort of knee jerk um, uh, reaction, then, then people are defensive. And when people are defensive, I don't know about you all, but I'm not thinking about why you're right and I'm wrong if I'm defensive, if I'm feeling defensive, right? I'm thinking about what I'm coming back with and probably not even listening to what you're saying. So I think we have to take that deep breath, assume goodwill unless it's obvious that it's not goodwill. And I also think sometimes when, when that isn't a possibility, we have to respectfully walk away. So when the joke is happening, you know what? This doesn't work for me, I'm gonna go over there. Those very simple steps that don't have to be dramatic speak volumes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree, Robert. I I think though there there are times though as as we think through those how to manage and react through particularly somebody in the same room, somebody in your office, somebody in your school. Uh, I think those are all, that's all good advice, but it, there's a, there's also a larger piece to that. It, it's about not being a bystander, you know, 
it, you know, it, it's it's not uh, it, when 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 you hear it done, whether it's done to yourself or to others, uh, you know, you, you have to whether it's walking away or whether it's whether it's saying, hey, that that's that's wrong, and 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 dealing with it there. Uh, what I encourage people to do is to act, is to not be a bystander, uh, you know, is to make it clear that what's going on is, is hateful, insulting, wrong, or dangerous. Uh, and, and however one does that uh, it, it, it is useful. Uh, just being passive, being a bystander, uh, you know, kind of letting it roll off your shoulders kind of thing. Uh, actually is empowering uh, to the hater. It's empowering to the anti-Semite. Uh, as long as they feel there's no consequences to their behavior, uh, that behavior will grow. And the people who are standing there listening to it, particularly young people, that that's their message is, oh, okay, that, that was okay. So I can do that. Uh, and so there has to be clear messaging that, that that's not okay. I think that's what we're doing here today. And that's what we do constantly is send that message. Uh, we can be sophisticated at times on how to manage it, but the message for me has to be clear. I have, I have a simple response, which is just to ask them to enroll at Camp Anytown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, especially if they're high school students. Especially uh, if they're... <laughs> <clears throat> yes. So for those who don't know, Anytown Leadership Institute is, um, is a program that OCCJ puts together in Oklahoma, and there's organizations around the nation who do a sim uh, Anytown uh, camps. Um, in fact, Roberta went through Anytown uh, uh, when she, when she um, was in high school, and um, it's a wonderful experience to uh, where these students create um, uh, uh, a radically inclusive community and they learn about their role in creating social change and, uh, and leave feeling empowered um, and learned uh, leadership skills. It's, it's a wonderful experience. So thank you, uh, Robert Kamen. So the last question that I have for the group um, and Drew already shared some wonderful resources um, but I wanted to ask the group, what resources are there for individuals who want to become um, allies to the Jewish community? And so just to recap what Drew had shared in Tulsa, there's the Sherwood Miller Museum, uh, there's the Holocaust Education Programming that the Jewish Federation in Tulsa puts together. There's an essay contest uh, that's wonderful for, for middle and high school students. Um, and Drew, if there's any more, and Roberta and Rabbi, if there's any more, please, please uh, share. I would suggest that it's important that we recognize when there is an incident that any particular resource is not a band-aid to fix the incident, right? Mm -hmm. That that true learning doesn't come from, I got in trouble, I have to go to the Holocaust Museum, or I have to go sit in this class, or I have to go talk to, you know, th that that's not... Um, you know, there's not band-aids. We all are, should be lifelong learners in, in, in as many ways as possible. And so I think, you know, Drew's point um, um, and Rabbi's point of people coming to the temple, uh, to, the, to the congregation, is that we have to be together with others and that the building allies is, build, is community building. And when we get to know each other, when we break down the barriers and we come together as agnostics and Jews and Christians and Muslims and Baha'i and, and on and on and on, and get to know each other as human beings, then we are building allies for the entire community um, so that when hateful actions happen, we all feel like we need to stand up and speak out appropriately because we feel a connection with that community member or that community organization. So I think the biggest resource, yes, the Anti-Defamation League has fabulous resources on how to respond to anti-Semitism for all ages and stages. And so I highly recommend that. But I think the biggest way to build allies is to build community. I, I would agree. And I would also remark that we are in one of the, and I apologize for the dogs barking in the background, um, but we are in one of the most remarkable moments of religious innovation and experimentation, 
I think probably in human history, maybe that's uh, bold to say or hubris to say, but on any given Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you can travel the world religiously from the screen you're watching this experience from. And that's a beautiful way to look in on a Jewish service or a Muslim service or a church service or any, uh, any experience you have not yet had. My guess is it's likely happening online. In three dimensions, to come into a synagogue means you need to well, put on the clothes, get in the car, find the address, park the car, go into the door, go past the people, experience all of the awkwardness of being in a place for the first time of maybe in a synagogue, at least there's Hebrew spoken. So encountering a, a foreign language, uh, foreign rituals, all sorts of things, which are, are, are really are barriers. They are, they are barriers, not intentional barriers, but they just happen to be anytime you have a new experience, something that makes you uncomfortable right now. None of those barriers exist. You can be cooking dinner or having breakfast. And in fact, one of my favorite things about our religious moment right now is we have our Saturday morning services at the synagogue at 10 a.m. And there are multiple people who are in front of their screens. I'm right here where I am right now. And they are having breakfast while we're having services. I love it. So if you want to have breakfast with me on Saturday morning, come. That's a resource that's available to you now. And by the way, when we go back to three-dimensional programming, also know that our buildings, our programs, the things we do as a synagogue are open. And to also know as Jews, we are not a proselytizing religion. There is no recruitment manual you have to sign. There is no pledge you have to make. There is no nothing. We are happy to share what we do with the world so that you can learn from it and so that we can learn from you. Um, and, but, but, but also to recognize that in this moment um, is probably the easiest moment to experience uh, what Jewish community looks like. Um, and, and I hope you will do that because at the synagogue, we'd be happy to have you. Tulsagog.com. Uh, check us out on Facebook, facebook.com backslash Tulsagog. You, Moises can send out all of our contact information. For sure, we will definitely do that. Drew, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just, just one other observation. Uh, the rabbi said it. I, th I think at times like this, times of crisis are an opportunity for innovation. They are an opportunity for expanding oneself. Uh, they also create an opportunity for the, for that fringe group that, that were talking about that bring hate and anti-Semitism to us. And so during this, these crises, it is also the time and our communities are good at it for us to support our, particularly our, our, our not-for-profit uh, organizations, you know, our, our Jewish institutions, uh, OCCJ, you know, uh, all the other groups that we, that we deal with. Um, we're all feeling the crisis. We're all feeling the financial crisis. But to keep our organization strong now creates the strength we need to come out of this, you know, and, and, and to be better when, when we move on to the next thing that will inevitably happen. And so the, these windows are open at the moment and we're all working. I can, I can speak for, and I know our federations, I know Roberta would agree, we're all we're all in our congregations, we're all in the process of, of, of building strength through crisis. Uh, anything else is unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. So wonderful, again, wonderful remarks. I wanted to highlight some of the things that I heard you say uh, during our time together. And I'll start with um, Rabbi Kamen, who who just shared about the role of technology and how easy it is for us to have fantastic experiences uh, as, it, as it relates to uh, world religions from um, our own living rooms, dining room tables, and, and really uh, get to um, see how others uh, worship, how others uh, share with each other, how others build community, which, um, 
kind of it's tied back to what I heard at the beginning in, in relation to some of the comments Drew was, was saying um, with um, the rise of anti, uh, anti-Semitism and how technology is also making uh, this, the, the spread of propaganda and the recruitment uh, of, of individuals into these movements uh, so easy. Uh, but some of the things that I, that I heard as well are in regards to um, just the concept of hate, um, that um, individuals who are anti-Semitic are likely to be anti um, LGBTQ, perhaps racist, um, and that we build allies when we build community. Uh, and we build allies for multiple communities uh, by the simple act of coming together, getting to know each other. Um, I, I, I love that, that you all mentioned that anti-Semitism is not something that is new. Uh, it's been around for centuries. Uh, and, and it's a mystery how these lies um, continue to be shared and spread and, and um, unfortunately in, in, in the United States and around the world to grow, but um, the responses that we're seeing locally uh, uh, fill us of hope. Um, uh, Roberta, you mentioned uh, about the power of our actions and, and Drew also uh, I mentioned the specifically not being bystanders. So when we see something rather than just staying quiet and letting it Take, take place, we say something. Even if, if, we, um, if, if we respectfully walk away and say, this is not okay with me and we walk away, uh, we do not just allow it to happen. Um, but uh, I love Roberta's um, suggestions of um, assuming good intentions, pulling people aside uh, in a way that is not um, confrontational and asking what they what they meant by that and, and explaining and using those uh, situations as, as teachable moments um, if, if we feel safe in doing that. Um, there was the, 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 the comments that um, tolerance is not enough. Uh, we should not be aiming at tolerating each other, but really uh, accepting and respecting each other. And um, I'll use the, um, the title of the book that Robert Kamen shared, which is, you don't have to be wrong for me to be right. And um, what I really loved from all of you who shared in regards to how do we talk about this with youth. Um, and and you, you said that, um, uh, you know, asking our, our, ourselves and others, how can you choose to hate someone that you haven't even met? Um, how, why, why do you, how do you go through, the, through that process? Um, I love the reference uh, that Rabbi Kamen mentioned of do not oppressing or not oppressing the stranger um, because we know what it's like to be oppressed. Um, and uh, Drew mentioned that we are not born hateful, that hate is learned. And so um, that all of us um, have a responsibility to teach uh, and to help people move forward in their journey of becoming uh, more inclusive. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your time, uh, for your time this morning, for being part of this conversation, but more importantly, for the work that you do every day. Um, for reaching out, for uh, inspiring us to be better individuals. And, and I have the privilege to know the three of you and, and every time I'm with you, with each of you, um, I feel like I'm a better person. Um, so thank you for, for the work that you do and for building community, um, especially as it was mentioned, uh, building community every day so that uh, when we have to face incidents of hate, we already have those relationships in place to come together. So thank you all. I wanna um, um, turn the time over to Avery for some closing remarks. Thank you, Marthas. Um, wow, uh, 
thank you all again for participating in this conversation for everybody who's uh, been watching on Facebook. Um, you know, to echo uh, a lot of what uh, Moises said, what I've really understood from this conversation is that we have to be vigilant about the safety of our communities. And, um, you know, we have to speak up and let people know that we don't agree with anti-Semitic remarks, uh, symbols, actions, and, um, you know, use our voice in a positive way to affect change. So thank you all for sharing that, uh, that information with us. Um, and you can keep up with OCCJ um, on our website, on Instagram, and of course, our Facebook page. And uh, you'll find uh, more information about um, our youth programs, uh, the My Generation Essay Contest, where we ask people to, where we ask high school students to uh, think of a visionary leader and their strategies that they use, the community that was behind them, and whether those strategies would work today. Um, and also, um, our Different in the Same program, which uh, uh, we uh, talks about some of the things that we've talked about today, which is, you know, how do we talk to young people about, you know, hatred and uh, hatred for uh, our identities. And um, we also find information about our adult programs, the Inclusive Leadership Institute, and um, also um, our other video in the uh, panel series. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you all, truly.